Education Mobile, quality e-learning experience on the go. You're welcome. This is uh, yet another biological session with your uh, one and only biological tutor, uh, Olajide. As you know, this program is brought to you, it is far packed and brought to you uh, by Fusion Mobile e-learning clinic, uh, a kind of e-learning center on the go. Uh, they are there with you uh, through every learning process. And now for today, we're going to be looking at uh, the regulation of the internal environment of living organisms. Uh, what do I mean by internal environment? An internal environment speaks of an environment that is within. So how do we get to regulate this environment? How do we get to make sure that uh, the environment is conducive for every cell present during to function very well? Uh, so we're going to be looking at all that. We're going to be looking at the, uh, the parts that are involved in the regulation of the internal environment. We're going to be looking at how unicellular organisms are faring. In cell organisms like the amoeba and co, how they are faring. And we're going to be looking at uh, hormones as well, animal hormones and uh, plant hormones. Uh, this topic uh, promises to be explicit and exclusive, uh, uh, so don't, uh, don't blink, just stay tuned. Uh, so now, regulation of internal environment. Uh, the regulation of internal environment is generally known as homeostasis. Uh, the regulation of the internal environment of living organisms is known as homeostasis. Homeostasis is the process, the phenomenon, the different process uh, in, we are, in which the body engages in, in order to maintain a fairly constant environment. Uh, there are some cells of the body that would not function well if there is an aberration, if there is a change in their environment. Uh, there are uh, some that might uh, function abnormally, they might even get to that if there is a change in the environment. And who suffers all this? It is actually the organism uh, that tends to suffer it. Uh, you would recall that cells uh, combined together will form the tissue, uh, tissue combined together will form the organ, organ combined together will form the system, while the system will now make up the living organism. Uh, so the uh, person that gets to suffer, the, uh, the end sufferer of every action is the living organisms uh, himself, herself, or itself, as the case uh, may be. So homeostasis is the regulation of the internal environment. And now in cellular organism, how do they uh, do this? How do they get to uh, survive? Uh, so let's take uh, amoeba as a typical example. Amoeba actually possess a particular structure, and the name of that structure is the contractile vacuum. We we'll call it the contractile uh, vacuum, the contractile a uh, vacuum, the contractor vacuum. Uh, so what happens is this, uh, when a uh, large amount of water comes into the cell, uh, due to the fact that the cell is placed in an hypotonic solution, and the cell is placed in an hypotonic solution, and the in, inside of the cell is hypertonic. It means the cell will draw in water from the environment. Now, more water coming in, there is a great inflow of water coming in. At uh, what happens, there is a need for this structure to function. And uh, so the contractor vacuum functions well by, uh, by carrying out osmoregulation. And uh, they have to take away the water to make sure that uh, the cell does not become turgid. And when the cell becomes turgid, some cells might not function uh, well. And uh, so the contractor vacuum does the work of osmoregulation in unicellular organisms like amoeba as a case uh, may be. Uh, so now we'll be looking at uh, the regulation of internal environment in higher organisms, uh, mammals uh, to be precise. We'll be looking at those parts that are involved. And now what are the parts that are involved? And uh, now notably, one of them is called uh, the kidney. Uh, the kidney is a very uh, important organ that is involved in the maintenance uh, of the internal environment of living organisms. Uh, so even aside from the, uh, the kidney, we also have the skin. The skin is very, very important. The skin is very, very important. Uh, so aside from the skin, uh, we've got, aside from the skin as well, uh, we've got, uh, okay, aside from the skin, we have the liver. The liver is also very, very important. Uh, the brain is also part of it and many other. But these are notable ones, uh, the kidney, uh, the liver, and the skin. They are the essential ones. However, the brain is also uh, involved because the brain uh, regulates everything uh, that is happening. Uh, so now we're going to be starting with kidney. In our previous classes, we looked at kidney. Uh, we said the kidney it has a B-shaped structure. Uh, we said the unit of a kidney, the functional unit of a kidney, is called nephron. Uh, Here yeah, we made mention of that. It's called nephron as a functional unit of a kidney and we said there are about uh, about one million uh, urinary tubules urinary tubules is another name for nephron there are about one, uh, there are about one million urinary uh, tubules uh, 
in a human organism. As a case, uh, maybe. And we made mention, we looked at the diagram of the kidney and we looked at uh, some specific function of the kidney. We said a typical kidney has uh, an outer cortex, inner medulla, the pelvis, uh, the apex of pyramid, it has a Bowman's capsule, the loop of Ellen, and the glomerular filter. We look at the glomerulus rather, and we looked at all these extensively. And so now, what are the functions of the kidney? And one of the functions of the kidney is osmoregulation. Osmoregulation. And the kidney help in maintaining osmoregulation. And now it is, uh, it is done this way. The blood carries food materials down to the kidney. And uh, the blood carries urea, it carries glucose, it carries water, it carries hormones. Everything passes through the blood. The blood is the passage of food materials in the body. And so when the blood carries all this, and the blood has a high content of sugar in it, the blood has a high content of glucose in it, the concentration of the blood becomes greater than that of the cell. And when this happens, there is an aberration. Uh, because everything is supposed to be kept constant. They're supposed to be in equilibrium. Same level, uh, same sound, same height. Everything has to be the same. And uh, so what happens? The kidney will start functioning. How does the kidney function? The kidney, uh, would, uh, there's something we call ADH, antidiuretic hormone. It's a particular hormone that is involved in osmoregulation, antidiuretic hormone. What antidiuretic hormone does is that it will absorb water from the blood. Those content that, that makes the blood to be very, very high in concentration, it will absorb it, it will draw it away. And when it draws it away, it will come out as urine from the body. And thereby, the urine that comes out will now be very concentrated, to have high sugar content. And at that most time, you see uh, people when they urinate, you see different color, color changes and all that. So that's, uh, that's the body trying to maintain equilibrium, trying to maintain a fairly internal environment. As well, aside from osmoregulation, the kidney carries out the function of excretion. Excretion. And now, I remember in the previous class, we talked about the formation of urine. How urine is formed. I will say the first is ultrafiltration. Ultrafiltration. Ultrafiltration uh, simply means uh, when the blood brings food down to the kidney, uh, the kidney will take away uh, those parts that are useful. Uh, the kidney will leave it. Those parts that are not useful that need to be excreted, the kidney will draw it. And the kidney will draw it down into the Bowman's capsule uh, with the help of the glomerulus. Glomerulus is a mass of blood capillary. It acts as a filter. So when the blood is coming like this, uh, those parts that are not useful uh, will, will pass through and it will stay. Those parts that are useful uh, will stay back. However, most times, uh, even the parts that the body needs will still move. It will maneuver. It will find its way and it will move to the other side. Uh, so the ADH will do the work of selective reabsorption. Selective reabsorption simply means this time around you're picking your favorite. At this time around, you're letting go of the baggages. At this time around, you're not just allowing any other material to pass. That's what selective reabsorption means. And it, of course, uh, in the proxima covulated tubule uh, in the kidney. And so, after this stage, and the ADH does uh, its function, then the urine uh, will come out of the body. Don't forget, formation of urine uh, is actually uh, deals with three uh, particular phases. Uh, one of them is ultrafiltration, which occurs in the Bowman's capsule with the help of the glomerulus. Uh, the second is what we call Selective reabsorption. It occurs in the prosima covulated tube, and last one is hormonal secretion, and the hormone involved is the ADH. So at the end of the day, urine uh, will be passed out. Uh, so uh, lastly, one major important function of kidney as well is acid-base balance. Uh, whenever the kidney says uh, that the body, uh, the constitution of the body is now acidic, uh, what it does is that it will re it will uh, absorb the acidity there, and it will. Uh, Pass it out through urine. And when it senses that uh, there is a uh, uh, base as well, it does the same in order to maintain a fairly internal environment. Now, what are the conditions that could affect uh, the functioning of the kidney or the condition that would dictate uh, the pace of the kidney? And one of them is environmental temperature. Environmental temperature. Now, it has been uh, proven over time that on a hot day, on a sunny day, on a hot day, uh, people tend to urinate less compared uh, to. Uh, a particular cold day. Now, this one I'm trying to say, on the hot day, everywhere is sunny, everywhere is heaty, uh, you tend to sweat more. And now, there are various ways uh, by which we maintain a uh, fairly internal environment. Uh, it could be through sweating, it could be through exhalation by the lungs, uh, it could be through uh, you passing out urine by the kidney. Uh, so, what happens is this, on the hot day, you tend to sweat the more. So, when you sweat the more, the concentration of uh, water in your body will now be less. So, the parts that will be coming out as urine will be less. So, you don't... Uh, frequently visit the toilet on like a cold day uh, on a cold day you don't you don't you hardly sweat and so the water in the body has to go out as urine and so don't forget this 
on a hot day, uh, you, uh, you urinate less uh, due, to the fact that the, due to the fact that you are sweating more. On a cold day, don't forget, on a cold day, uh, you tend to urinate more due to the fact that you are sweating less. Uh, so don't uh, forget this fact. They are very, very important. So aside from that, drugs. Drugs also affect uh, the functioning of the kidney. Uh, there are some drugs that when you take them, their basic function is to help the kidney take out excess water and release it. Such drugs are called diuretics. I will call them diuretics. 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 Uh, diuretic, they help in uh, taking out high volume of water from the body. Drugs like that also have diseases as well. There are diseases that could affect the functioning of the kidney. Ah, a highlight of the diseases are diuresis. Diuresis, I uh, have an nephritis, I uh, have kidney stone, I have dropsy or odema. Diuresis, nephritis, kidney stone, dropsy or odema. As I've explained diuretics before, uh, those drugs are taken in order for the body to take away excessive water. Now when the body uh, refuses, diuresis is when uh, there is uh, water in the body and selective absorption is not taking place at its ought uh, to take uh, place. So diuresis can also be, co it can be controlled surgically. Uh, nephritis. Nephritis is uh, the inflammation of the kidney. Uh, the Bowman's capsule has been inflamed, so the Bowman's capsule is not kind of the function of uh, reabsorption. Uh, so what happens is that most times it's caused by bacteria. What happens is that nutrients will now be passed out. Nutrients that ought to be reabsorbed will now be passed out as urine. Nutrients that the body needs will now be passed out as urine. So that's what we call nephritic kidney stones. Now kidney stones simply talk about the presence of uh, some, some uh, a solid particle in the kidney, in the fast in the pathway or the pathway of the kidney, uh, there's present of uh, substances there. So what happens is that uh, uh, this kidney stone will, uh, will mar uh, the easy passage of urine, easy flow of urine will be mar. And that explains why most people suffering from this, uh, they find it hard to urinate. They feel pain when urinating and it can be controlled surgically. There's something we call a, a surgical remover of stones in the kidney. It's called nephrectomy. Nephrectomy, so it can actually uh, be controlled, it can be killed. Nephrectomy, so you remove uh, this particular uh, stone. As we have drop C uh, or Odema, drop C or Odema. And now, as I've said earlier, uh, usually the body absorbs water from the blood and it's part, it comes out as urine. Now, when the parts, uh, the glomerulus, those parts that are supposed to be carrying other function, when they are having problem and they refuse to carry out this function, there will be water in the body, there will be excessive water in the body. And what we will see is that some part of the body will become touchy, it will be shooting out, it will be swollen. Some part of the body will become swollen. So we call such situation dropsy or edema, and it can be controlled by dialysis. Dialysis, a situation whereby the water will be drawn out of the body. Uh, so that, those are the important functions and highlight of the kidney. Uh, don't forget, the kidney is very, very important. It is very, very important. Important and now we're going, we're going to be looking at the liver. Uh, the liver has a mass of 1.25 kilogram. Again, uh, the liver has a mass of 1.25 kilogram. Uh, the liver is one of uh, the most important organs in the body. It is very, very important. It carries out uh, fantastic functions in the body, and most of these functions are going to be going uh, through it. Again, uh, there's this uh, particular structure that is present in the liver. It is called uh, the gallbladder. It is called the gallbladder. And now take note, the liver secretes uh, bile. Bile is actually produced by the liver, but that bile is stored in the gallbladder. A bile is produced by the liver, but it is stored in the gallbladder. While is bile produced? Bile is produced for the emulsification of heart. Emulsification of heart. Emulsification. Emulsification. Emulsification simply means that you're breaking down these fats, and the major reason why you're breaking them down is to increase their surface area. When you increase their surface area, hormones, enzymes, they'll be, they'll be able to act very fast, and you'll be able to see your result on time. Again, emulsification simply talks about you breaking down fatty molecules. And while you're breaking them down, you're doing that in order to increase their surface area so that hormones, enzymes will be able to act on it. Even bacteria, uh, those are beneficial ones, so to speak. They will be able to act on it on time and you're able to get your desired result. Uh, the major function of emulsification is to increase digestion rate and reabsorption rate as gas uh, may be. Uh, so I said, uh, the liver is also dark red in color. It is dark red in color and it is divided into lobes. It is dark red in color and it is divided into lobes. Uh, the gallbladder of the liver, which stores bile, is connected to the duodenum via the bile duct. Uh, the gallbladder is connected to the duodenum via uh, the bile duct. A uh, bile emuls emulsifies fat, just as I said earlier. And now we're going to be looking at the functions uh, of the liver. 
are the functions of the liver are, are numerous. And one of them is what we call deamination. Deamination. Uh, deamination simply talks about breaking down of proteins. And uh, when we take in uh, protein in the body, protein is first broken down to peptones, from peptones to polypeptide, and uh, therefore poly polypeptide down uh, to amino acids. Uh, so the liver helps us to break down protein into amino acids. So that's what we call deamination. 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 It's breaking down of protein into amino acids. As I'm going have detoxification. And uh, most people, when they take in poisonous substances, it is the liver that helps them to neutralize it. Detoxification. Poisonous substances in the body are uh, probably you're taking alcohol, you're taking things that would uh, either mar or break you down. The liver uh, gets on the feet. Uh, the liver tends to work and the liver detoxifies it. That's the function of the liver. The liver helps in the formation of the red blood cell. In young growing embryo, the liver helps in the formation of the red blood cell. However, uh, in adults, the red blood cell is formed from the bone marrow. Uh, don't forget all these facts. They are very, very important. The liver produces bile, which helps in emulsification of fat. As a matter of fact, uh, when bile is actually broken down, uh, uh, there's, something we have, there's something we call bilirubin. Uh, bilirubin is responsible for the color of uh, your feces, your poop, your, uh, your sheet, as, you, as we locally call it. Bilirubin is actually responsible uh, for it. And so liver helps in breaking down and helps in sending out of the body and this leads to the coloring uh, of our feces. Uh, so aside from this, uh, the liver also helps in the production of some important vitamins such as vitamin A, uh, vitamin B complex. Uh, the liver does a uh, wonderfully well detoxification and uh, deamination. The liver helps in the regulation of blood sugar. Yes, when you have excess sugar in your body, uh, the liver, uh, with, the help of, with the aid of the pancreas, uh, will secrete insulin. What insulin does is insulin converts excess glucose into glycogen. This glycogen is now stored in the body. At last, a time will come uh, when the body will need uh, glucose, then this glycogen needs to be reconverted back into glucose. Uh, the liver, as usual, uh, will get to work. The pancreas will secrete what we call glucagon. To secrete what we call the glucagon. So what the glucagon does is to reconvert uh, glycogen back to glucose and so this uh, by, by so doing uh, the body temperature or uh, uh, the body internal environment is being uh, maintained so regulation of blood sugar a uh, regulation of uh, protein regulation of every vital thing in the body uh, is actually done by the liver don't forget detoxification is also being carried out uh, by the liver its function okay well done with that now we're going to look at the diseases uh, that are uh, that tends to affect the liver over time it has been proven uh, that the notable ones are diabetes mellitus diabetes mellitus what is diabetes mellitus and uh, now basically we have two types of diabetes we have diabetes mellitus and we have diabetes insipidus diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus what is diabetes mellitus diabetes mellitus simply talks about the inability of the pancreas to produce insulin which in turn will convert excess glucose to glycogen so what happens is this excess glucose will be present in the body and by so doing the rate of uh, uh, the concentration of the body gets increased and so there will be problems different malfunctioning of the cells are uh, with their for setting don't forget the diabetes mellitus is the inability of the body to produce insulin which will convert excess glucose to glycogen however what is diabetes insipidus diabetes insipidus talks about uh, the inability of the body to produce ADH, which will reabsorb nutrients from the kidney back into the body, and then the remaining water will go out. So when this uh, ADH is not produced, when this ADH is not signal, when they fail to work, nutrients will flow out from the body. And so when nutrients run out of the body, we we'll call it diabetes insipidus. Inability of them to reabsorb nutrients from the body, we we'll call it diabetes insipidus. And so it also affects the liver. So we have diabetes mellitus, and we have what we call a uh, Infective hepa hepatitis, infective hepatitis, it also affects the liver. Uh, where it is like uh, an inflammation uh, of the liver. It could be a virusic disease, it could be caused by virus and all that. I uh, have C, uh, cirrhosis of the liver. This is caused uh, by taking alcohol. Uh, when you take excessive alcohol in the body, more than the body can hold, uh, it inflames uh, the liver and uh, this results cirrhosis. We also have cancer of the liver. However, all this can actually be corrected. We have the gallstones as well. Uh, the, what the gallstones uh, does is this. The gallstones tend to block the pathway of the liver. I said uh, we have the bile duct, uh, we have the gallbladder. The gallbladder stores bile. The gallbladder is connected to the duodenum via the bile duct. And so what the gallstones uh, do is this. It stays in the pathway. It blocks it. So we have things, we have materials are supposed to pass. They won't be able to pass. 
Alas, when Billy Rubin is being broken down, when Billy Rubin is present, remember, I said Billy Rubin is responsible for the color of physics. So they are supposed to go out uh, into the small intestine, down into their body. Okay, uh -huh. down into the body. Okay, so this is Billy, Re Billy Rubin. Billy Rubin, Billy Rubin, Billy Rubin, Billy Rubin, B I L I R U B I E, Billy Rubin, Billy Rubin, uh, Billy Rubin. Uh, so what? Uh, so what really happened is this: uh, when those Billy Rubin is actually broken and is present uh, in the bile, it's supposed to go out via the bile duct. Uh, but because of these stones uh, that are present there, they will not hamper uh, the passage of the Billy Rubin. Uh, so now, what is this effect? Join this. I uh, will now be seen obstructive join this. John this will be seen, and John this is notable among uh, light colored, uh, light skin colored people. And uh, when they start having yellowish patches all around, I uh, will call it John this, and it is as a result of this uh, gold stones and other. Uh, so those are the important things uh, you need to know on that liver. And uh, so now we'll be traveling a bit, and we'll be looking at the skin. The skin, the skin is ah uh, one of the largest organ. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the skin is the largest organ in the body. It is one of the toughest organ after uh, uh, the bones. After the bone, it is one of the toughest organs. I think it's ranking at, at number three, uh, so to speak. So the skin is basically divided into two. It's divided into the dermis and the epidermis. It's divided into dermis and epidermis. Epidermis talks about on the surface, at the top. It is me you're going to see before you see another person. What dermis talks about are uh, underneath. Underneath are uh, the, the, the epidermis. And so now, we're going to be looking at the highlight of the epidermis. And what then is the epidermis? The epidermis is divided into the only layer. The only layer or the cornified layer. But only the only layer <coughs> or the cornified layer. Now, this is the outermost layer. The outermost layer of the epidermis is called the only layer or the cornified layer. It consists of hard, dead, and scaly cells. It consists of hard, dead, and scaly cells. It is heavily impregnated with keratin. A keratin is a, ah, a tough, how do I, how do I call it? A tough structure, so to speak. Uh, when you look at your toenails, your fingernail, keratin is actually responsible uh, for the development of this. We're going to be looking into that extensively as well. Uh, the outermost layer is called the epidermis. It consists of hard, dead, and scaly cells. It is heavily impregnated with keratin. It is constantly being worn out. That is one of the things uh, that you need to know about uh, the only layer. It is constantly being worn out and it's being replaced by the cells below. What are the cells below? The cells below are called the malfigan. The cells below are called ah, sorry, the cells below are called the granular layer. The cells below are called the granular layer. However, the cells below ah, is also connected to another cell. And so the cells below get ah, things from the cells ah, beneath it. And so when they get it, they now transport it to the cells above. You get what I'm trying to say? Uh, the one ah, in between uh, gets something ah, underneath. Uh, when it gets it, it passes it uh, off. And so we have the granular layer. The granular layer consists of living cells. Uh, they also consist of keratin and they die. So that's where it is. They consist of living cells. And these living cells, they pass uh, some of their function is to help the only layer. So aside from the granular layer, uh, we have the last one, which is the malfigian layer. The malfigian layer is also called the germinative layer. Malfigian layer is also called the germinative layer. It consists of actively dividing cells. Malfigian layer is also called the germinative layer. It consists of actively dividing cells. And these cells have the ability to regenerate, and they have the ability to regrow, and they have the ability to grow at a faster rate. And that's why we call them actively uh, dividing cells. And one highlight of uh, their function again is that they possess melanin. Ah, by now, I think you ought to have known the function of melanin. Melanin is a coloring pigment. It's responsible for uh, the dark coloration of humans. Melanin is responsible for the dark coloration of humans. It is found in the malfigan layer of the epidermis. Don't forget this. It is responsible for the dark coloration of humans. It is found in the malfigan layer of the epidermis. Never forget. It also possesses uh, the keratin. It also possesses the keratin. Uh, so those are the highlights of the Epidermis. Again, the epidermis is briefly is broadly uh, subdivided into three. I have the only layer, only confined layer. We have the granular layer, and lastly, we have the malfigan layer. Uh, the granular layer consists of living cells. Uh, the only layer consists of dead cells. While malfigan layer consists of actively uh, dividing cells. So we're now going to be looking at the dermis. Okay, welcome back. Uh huh. So we're still on dermis. 
Uh, we've looked at uh, the epidemics. I said we have the onion or qualified layer, we have the granular layer, and lastly, we have the malfigian or the germinative layer. Uh, we said the onion layer consists of dead cells, uh, scaly cells. Uh, uh, we said a particular time will come when they will get worn out and they get their uh, support or they get their rejuvenation uh, from the cells that are beneath. So I also said uh, the granular layer consists of living cells. A uh, wife for the malfigian layer, also known as the germinative layer, they consist of actively dividing cells. It is there that you find the uh, uh, the melanin, which is the coloring pigment uh, for humans. Uh, so now we're going to be looking at the dermis. The dermis, the dermis, the dermis. Epidermis is at the top, at the top. The upper dermis, that's epidermis. So now we're looking at the dermis itself, the dermis itself, which is on nani. Now don't forget, it is uh, the malfigian layer uh, goes deeply and it forms uh, the dermis, and these are uh, will have all these features of the dermis. So we're going to be looking at it. Now the dermis, uh, for a particular thing to be called a dermis, uh, it needs to have a blood capillary air follicle, sensory nerve ending, the sweat gland, the sebaceous gland, and lastly, it needs to have the subcutaneous fat. Subcutaneous fat. And now the blood capillary, what's the function ah, of the blood capillaries? And now basically the blood capillaries helps in carrying uh, food substances down to the skin. Uh, so food substances will come to the skin like that, you know, and they've got to survive as well. We have veins, we have everything. So the blood capillaries, uh, they need to contain blood capillaries for the passage of blood and everything in order to keep them alive, healthy and okay. So they also have the air follicle, the air follicle. Uh, the air follicle is a deep pit uh, that is formed as a result of the infolding of the malfigian tube. Ah, uh, it is a deep pit that is a deep pit, deep pit. It is formed as a result of the infolding of the malfigian tubule, ah, the malfigian layer, ah, rather, the malfigian layer, not malfigian tubule, of the malfigian layer. And the malfigian layer is called, again, the germinative layer. Ah, it is also seen that the air follicle consists of air erector muscle, air erector muscle, air erector muscle, air erector muscle. Air erector muscles are usually associated with the follicle. They are associated with the follicle. Now, most time I'm uh, doing cold days, uh, most of the, what happens is this, uh, they tend to, uh, they make your air follicle stand upright. That's their function, the air uh, erector muscle. They make it erect. Erect means to stand upright, to stand in position. And most times you tend to say you're having uh, goose pimples, like, ah, oh, I'm uh, sort of, like, like that. I say it's actually the function of the air erector muscle. And so now we're going to be looking at the sebaceous gland. The sebaceous gland is an oily gland. The sebaceous gland, again, is an oily gland. It secretes oil, oil, oil. It is an oily gland, oily gland, oily gland. The sebaceous gland is an oily gland. It secretes oil. What's the function of this oil? Uh, the oil helps to ward off, uh, uh, helps to ward off attack from bacteria and microorganisms. And that is it. You know, when they notice that your, your skin is moist and all that, they, they dare not penetrate or tend to stay on it. So they tend to, they will protect the body from dust and microorganisms. So what have the sweat gland? What's the function of the sweat gland? Uh, the sweat gland absorbs water from the, uh, the blood and excretes it out of the skin. So we have the sweat gland, they are on the skin as well, so they come out of sweat. Now we have the sensory nerve ending. The sensory nerve ending is carrying out the sensory function. Ah, hope you know that the skin is a sense organ. As a matter of fact, it's an organ of touch. And when you touch it, it becomes sensitive to it. It picks up ah, ah, up sensory information and it passes it to the necessary part of the body, notably the brain, and the brain will carry out ah, a kind of response ah, towards it. And so now we have the subcutaneous part. The subcutaneous fat. The subcutaneous fat is below the dermis. The B is this below the dermis. And one interesting thing about subcutaneous fat is that it stores fat. It stores fat. The fat is called adipose tissue. It is called adipose tissue. Lastly, it is called adipose tissue. It is a long term food store. Food is stored there. Do you know food is stored in the skin? We are in the subcutaneous fat. It is called the adipose tissue. So, this, uh, this particular part also helps to insulate the body. It helps to insulate the body. Now, we're going to be looking at the function of the skin. Uh, the skin helps in protection, it helps in uh, protecting the body, it helps in excretion, excretion of sweat, uh, it helps in carrying out sensory function, it helps carrying out sensitivity, the skin is actually sensitive. When you notice a place is very hot, it tends to move away, and uh, when you get to look for, when you tend to look for a, a substance, uh, a sharp object or a hard object to uh, kind of pick somebody, and uh, when you just do it, and the person will shout, you know, that's like a reflex stuff, so it helps the body in uh, sensitivity. It has a body sensitivity. Uh, one of uh, its major functions, again, is that uh, it 
helps in it helps in the production of vitamin D. It helps in the production of vitamin D. I know you've heard of that uh, that popular phrase that uh, early morning sun is good for the body. Uh, yeah, it's actually true. It helps in the production of vitamin D, not a uh, very hot sun. No, no, no early morning sun. It's actually good. Uh, it also helps in the production of milk. Ah, what am I saying? Yes. It does in the production of milk. Uh, do you know that uh, it is actually part of the skin that forms the mammary gland? It is part of the skin that forms the mammary gland. And the mammary gland is functional is to like uh, uh, the release of milk. So it is safe to say it helps in the, uh, the production of milk. And lastly, it helps in the regulation of body temperature. It helps in the regulation of body temperature. Uh, on a hot day, uh, you tend to sweat the more. So that way, it's trying to keep your body relaxed. On a cold day, and when you feel shivery and all that, you tend to feel warm. So it does many miraculous things. And when it comes to regulation of body temperature, we have got two different types or two categories of organisms. We have homoethamic organisms, and we have poikolo, poikilo, poikilo. We have poikilotami. The word homo talks about constant temperature. The word poikilo talks about variable. The word tamic eats. Eat. So homoetamic. Homoetamic are organisms uh, with constant temperature. They are organisms with constant temperature. As a matter of fact, we'll call them warm blooded organisms. They are warm blooded organisms. Warm blooded organisms. Ah, the temperature is always kept constant. There is a way they do their thing in order to maintain a fairly constant internal environment. A very good example is man. Man is an homoethamic animal. Man is an homoethamic organism. Man has constant temperature. Are you with me? It doesn't vary. They, they, they always look for a way to maintain it or uh, to bring it down to the average. And now, poikilotamic organisms are organisms with variable temperature. They are called cold blooded organisms. Cold blooded organisms. And the organism varies. It varies. It varies. It varies. It varies. It has no constancy. It varies. And so, kind of poikilotamic animal, a very good example uh, is your bear. <coughs> a very good example is your lizard, your lizard, your frog, uh, birds. Uh, fishes, they are all poikilotamic organisms. Homoethamic organism is man, mammals. Mammals are homoethamic. Mammals are homoethamic. Don't forget that. So now we'll be looking at the care of the skin. How can you care for your skin? Uh, by bathing regularly, uh, by not uh, by not allowing yourself get injured here and there. And one thing again is that when you get injured, uh, learn to dress your wound uh, very well. A uh, regular exercise also helps the body in burning fat and every other thing. And by taking balanced diet. Balanced diet is the meal that contains uh, all the kinds of food in the right portion or in the right proportion, uh, any, any way you choose uh, to call it. Uh, so those are the ways by which you can take care of your skin. And so now, uh, it's been uh, some questions will pop up on your screen. Uh, I just try as much as possible to uh, do the needful. And we would be looking at uh, animal hormones as well as plant hormones. And those parts are, ah, uh, uh, they are well. Okay, so now we would be looking at uh, animal hormones. Uh, you need to take note of the fact that uh, for every uh, particular uh, structure, particular organ, or particular function carried out by plant, uh, there is uh, also another structure kind of that particular function in animal and so since we have animal hormones definitely uh, there is a need for us to also have what plant hormones and so after animal hormones we will be looking at uh, plant hormones extensively now what are hormones generally hormones are chemical substances or biochemical substance and uh, what do i mean by biochemical biochemical means uh it's there are chemicals that are involved in biochemical reaction chemicals involved in biological reactions so we call them biochemical chemicals involved in biological reactions uh, so they are either chemical substances or biochemical substances and uh, one major uh characteristic of uh, an hormone is that they are produced in minute quantity the word minute talks about small quantity, little quantity. So hormones are biochemical substances that are produced in minute quantities. They are produced in minute quantities in one part of the body and then they are transported to their site of action. Now this is it. Hormone is not produced at the site of action. Hormone is produced at a particular part of the body and then they will now be transported to their site of action. 
Uh, I hope you've gotten the definition. And so I take it again. Hormones are chemical substances or chemical substances that are produced in minute quantities uh, in one part of the body and are transported to their site of action where they exert their effect uh, controlling the body metabolism, uh, growth processes, <laughs> uh, reproduction process. Every process in the body are controlled uh, by hormones. Now, hormones are also referred to as chemical messengers or organic messengers. You want to carry out a function, uh, you need an errand boy, uh, all you need to do is call on an, a particular woman and they will carry out the function. Are you with me? Uh, you want to release milk, uh, you call on a particular woman, uh, it will work out. So hormones are called chemical messengers or, or organic messengers. And now hormones, the glands that are responsible for the production of hormones are called endocrine glands. They are called endocrine glands. They are called endocrine gland. Endocrine gland is also referred to as ductless gland. Ductless gland. Ductless gland. Now, hormones are produced by the ductless gland. What do I mean by ductless gland? A ductless gland simply means a duct. Uh, the ductless gland simply means a gland that lacks ducts. Uh -huh. So, since we know that the gland producing hormones lack ducts, how then do hormones move? Uh, how then do hormones get transported? How do they change position with respect to time? Uh, the answer is not far fetched. You and I know uh, that a uh, ductless gland is also known as an endocrine gland, and ductless gland is a gland that lacks ducts. So, what hormone does is it hormone diffuse into the bloodstream. There is no duct to carry, uh, there is no duct that to serve as passage of hormone. So what hormone does is that it diffuses straight into the bloodstream and so the blood carries the hormone about. That's all. That's a tricky issue. Yes, but it works for them. And so hormone diffuses into the bloodstream and the blood carries them to the part of the body where they carry out their function. Don't forget the gland responsible for the production of the hormones are uh, generally the hard word, ductless gland or the endocrine gland. Hormones are also referred to as chemical messengers or organic messengers. Hormones are minute in quantities and they are produced in one part of the body and they are sent to their targeted organs where they exact their effect to control the production, our body metabolism, growth, everything and that has to do with uh, survival, respiration and everything. And so hormone uh, does that. So now we'll be looking at uh, the groups of hormones, the major, the glands in the body that produce hormones. We are going to be looking at them. And I know you've been observing that uh, we have the picture uh, of a wonderful man uh, on the board. And the man is actually well living. So we're going to be looking at it now. Uh, it will interest you to know that this is you. Yeah. Are uh, you uh, that you're looking at me now? This uh, is you. And now at this particular portion, we have a particular gland there. That gland is called the pituitary gland. This gland is known as the master gland. It's known as the master gland. Its activities control every other gland. Don't forget, pituitary gland uh, is known as the master gland. Uh, this is the location of the pituitary gland. This is the location of the pituitary gland. Uh, it's located at the anterior lobe. It is a, this is the position of the pituitary gland. It is called the master gland. It regulates every activities of other gland. Its activities uh, will determine what other glands uh, will do. Uh, so now coming down to the neck region, I will have two wonderful hormones here. Uh, to my right, we have the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland, and to the left, we have the Parathyroid gland. The right we have, para, we have thyroid gland. The left we have uh, the parathyroid gland. So coming down now to the chest region, uh, uh, the upper part of the chest region, uh, very close uh, to the right hand side, we have the pancreas. The pancreas. Uh, you and I know the pancreas uh, that secrete the insulin uh, and the glucagon. But we'll be looking at that uh, critically as well. And now to the left, uh, we have the adrenal gland. Adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is also called the emergency uh, hormone. The emergency hormone. Emergency hormone. Uh, so now we've looked at the pituitary gland, we've looked at the thyroid gland, we've looked at the parathyroid gland, we've looked at the adrenal gland, and we've looked at the pancreas. And so now what is this uh, that we've got here? This is the positioning of the ovary. Uh, the ovary in females. And this is the positioning of the testes. The testes in male. Are you with me? The testes also have their own hormone. I uh, will be looking at that as well. The ovary also have their own hormone. We'll be looking at that as well. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to be looking at uh, the various endocrine glands in the body. We're going to be looking at their location. We're going to be looking at the hormones, the secrets, and lastly, uh, we're going to be looking at the function, their functions, and their effect as well. Uh, so the first on our list is the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland it is located at the base of the midbrain. The pituitary gland is located at the base of the midbrain. Uh, it produces, uh, or should I say, it secretes uh, wonderful and uh, and marvelous hormones. And now, what are these hormones? Uh, one of them is uh, prolactin. Prolactin. 
Proactin help in milk production. Another one is oxytocin. Oxytocin helps in the flow of milk. Prolactin helps in milk production. Oxytocin helps in the flow of milk. I will have antidiuretic hormone, which I've spoken extensively on earlier. Uh, it helps in reabsorption, reabsorption, reabsorption. It helps to reabsorb useful materials from the glomerular filtrate. We also have the somatropin, also called the pituitarine, or the pituitarine, or also called the somatropin, anywhere you choose to put it. Uh, they promote the growth of bones and muscles. And lastly, we have the tropic hormones. We have the tropic hormones as well. And now, never forget that uh, hormone, the pituitary gland is called the master gland. The pituitary gland is called the master gland. Why? Because it controls every other activity. And so now we're going to be looking at the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is located at the anterior region of the neck. It produces a particular hormone called thyroxine. And the hormone produced by the thyroid gland is called thyroxine. Thyroxine helps to regulate the rate of metabolism, especially respiration. It helps to regulate the, the rate of metabolism, especially respiration. It stimulates mental and physical growth and development in young animals. Mental and physical growth and development in young animals. It controls metamorphosis in tadpole. Metamorphosis simply talks about transformation. Transformation from the larva to the pupa to the imago. It controls metamorphosis in tadpoles. And so the third on our list is the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid gland is found on the anterior part of the neck, near the thyroid gland, very, very close to the thyroid gland, anterior part of the neck. It secretes what we call parathormone. Parathormone uh, controls the level of calcium content in the blood. Parathormone controls the level of calcium content in the blood. And so for the fourth one, we have the pancreas. Uh, the pancreas, uh, which are produced at the isolate of Langerhans. Uh, the pancreas is located in the loop of the duodenum. It has two major enzymes, which are the uh, two major hormones, rather, which are insulin and glucagon. Insulin uh, converts excess glucose to glycogen, uh, while gl uh, glucagon uh, converts excess uh, glycogen or the stored glycogen back to glucose. And the fifth one is the adrenal gland. Adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is at the top of the kidney. The adrenal gland is at the top of the kidney. Adrenal gland secretes what we call adrenaline. Adrenaline is known as emergency hormone. It is produced during fright, uh, during fright or fear. Emergency hormone. The adrenal gland increases uh, the heartbeat and respiration. It increases the heartbeat and respiration. It increases the sugar content of the blood. It increases the muscular tone. It is responsible for shivering during cold. When you're shivering during cold, that's a function of the adrenal gland. It prepares the body for emergency. As I said earlier, it's called the emergency hormone. It is associated with fear and anxiety, anxiousness. Ah, and right there in the stomach, uh, the location of the production of hormone is the epithelium. And uh, in the stomach, we have the gastrin. The gastrin is produced. It activates the gastric gland to produce the gastric juice. And the test is the location of production of the hormone is the scrotum. Uh, the scrotum. The scrotum is the, uh, the location of production of hormone. And the hormone that is produced is called the testosterone. Testosterone. Testosterone is called the male reproductive hormone. It stimulates the appearance of secondary sexual characteristics in males. It stimulates the appearance of secondary sexual characteristics in males at puberty. E.g. pubic hairs, uh, the hairs that are found in the private part, the beards, the mustache, the thick muscles, and the deep voice. The deep voice. Uh, it also stimulates the production of uh, spermatozoa uh, by the testes. Uh, spermatozoa are sperm by the testes. And lastly, stimulate the development of the male organ, uh, which is the penis. The penis. And lastly, on our list, we have the ovaries. Uh, the ovaries, the location of production of hormones in the ovaries is actually within the ovary itself. Uh, two particular hormones are produced, which are oestrogen and progesterone. Oestrogen and progesterone. Oestrogen stimulate the development of female secondary characteristics as puberty. As such as pubic hairs, round body, uh, uterus growth, and breast development. Uh, the progesterone prepares the uterus for the attachment of the embryo. Uh, the uterus is also called the womb. It prepares the womb for the attachment of the embryo, just like the implantation of the embryo. It maintains the photos during its development in the uterus. Uh, the result in the developing child, it maintains the growth of that child. It maintains the photos during its development in the uterus. And so don't forget again, it's called the pregnancy 
hormone. Okay, so now we've spoken uh, extensively uh, concerning the glands, their location, hormones secreted, and their function. That's why I said for the pituitary gland, uh, we have the ADH, uh, we have the prolactin, we have the oxytocin, and we have the tropic hormone, and we have the somatropin. Uh, for the thyroid gland, they secrete the tyrosine, uh, the parathyroid gland secretes uh, para, uh, parat hormone, and the pancreas, which is the isolate of lagaland, uh, secretes what we call the insulin and the glucagon, and the gland secretes the adrenaline. In the stomach, we have the gastrin, uh, which gives uh, instruction to the gastric gland to produce gastric juice. Ah, and the test is one of the testosterone it is responsible for uh, puberty development in males, uh, uh, the development of beards, mustache. It's also responsible for the development of the penis. There's only for the production of spermatozoa as well. While for the ovaries, I have two important hormones. Uh, one is called estrogen. Uh, the function of the testosterone in male uh, is being complemented as it's being complemented and carried out in the female as well. In the female, the estrogen helps uh, the production of uh, uh, puberty characteristics. Uh, you see pubic hairs, hairs in the private part. Uh, some ladies actually, they, some do have mustache. You see around uh, development of breast as well. And the progesterone is called the pregnancy hormone. It helps in the implantation of the embryo uh, in, uh, in the womb. The womb is called uh, uterus. And it helps in maintaining uh, the development of the fetus, uh, the young child, the young child that is growing up in the womb as well. Uh, so now we are going to be looking at the under secretion and the over secretion of these important hormones. Uh, what do I mean by under secretion? Uh, when they are, uh, they are produced in little quantity compared to how much they have been needed. Uh, this is what I'm trying to say. Under secretion means when they are secreted uh, uh, compared to uh, the amount we hope to see. Under secretion. Why over secretion is when they are over secreted. Under secretion means when they are under secreted, when they are lowly secreted, and when they are highly secreted is over secretion. So we're going to be looking at the effects of these hormones. If tyrosine is over secreted, what will happen? If it is under secreted, what will happen? Uh, uh, if a uh, parathormone is over secreted, what will happen? If it is under secreted, what is going to happen? We're going to be looking at that. Okay, so I haven't uh, looked at uh, the various glands in the body, uh, their location, the hormones they secrete their functions as well as their effects. Uh, so now we're going to be looking at hormones, the effect of their over secretion and under secretion or deficiency. Uh, so now the first on our list uh, is the pituitary uh, gland and the hormone we're looking at is the somatropin. Somatropin. So now we're going to be looking at the effect of its over secretion. Over secretion of somatropin in children leads to gigantism again over secretion of somatropin in children uh, leads to gigantism while in adults it leads to acromegaly acromegaly is a situation uh, which leads to increase in the size of the head the ends the body as well as the leg uh, what is the under secretion of the pituitary gland which is uh, the growth hormone the under secretion of the growth hormone is that it leads to dwarfism uh, dwarfism is a situation of retarded growth. Uh, when growth is uh, decelerating instead of accelerating. So now the next on our list is the adrenaline. Adrenaline is generally known as emergency hormone. Uh, over secretion of adrenaline will lead to uh, increase in excitement and anxiety, increase in blood pressure and heartbeat, increase in the dilation of the pupils. Uh, it also leads to every breathing, every, every breathing rather. It results in profuse sweating. Under secretion of adrenaline will lead to low blood pressure, a low heart rate, and it brings about slow response to emergency. Over secretion of insulin uh, will lead to fall in blood sugar level. It results in hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia simply means a low sugar content in the body. It leads to incessant hunger. Uh, under secretion of insulin will cause diabetes mellitus. It will also lead to high blood pressure, less appetite and great task for water. It also leads to general weakness. Over secretion of the tyroxine, 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 which is resulting from the thyroid gland, will result in hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism simply means increase in metabolic rate. It also leads to overactivity or restlessness. It brings about bulging of eyeballs. And lastly, it leads to loss of weight. Under secretion of the tyroxine will lead to hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is low metabolic rate. It also leads to sluggishness, slowness. And in fact, it results in a condition called cretinism. It may result in goiter, yeah, a swelling, uh, 
around uh, the neck. Uh, the testosterone, uh, which is a male reproductive hormone, its result over secretion of it will result uh, in excessive development of sexual organs. Uh, you see people developing beards anyhow and secondary uh, sexual characters. It leads to abnormal urge for sex in males. Abnormal urge, a strong urge for sex in males. And the secretion of it will lead to underdevelopment of sexual organs. It could also lead to low urge for sex. Oestrogen, which is uh, uh, the female hormone or the female reproductive hormone, as the case may be, results in over secretion of it will result in abnormal urge for sex. It could also lead to early maturity of secondary sexual characters in females. Uh, you see somebody at age seven already developing breasts. That is over secretion. Under secretion of it will lead to poor development of the reproductive system. And there is also a delay in secondary sexual maturity. At age 30, we are still looking for it. Mm. Paratomone. Mm. It is secreted by the parathyroid gland. Uh, it causes softening of bones. Over secretion of it will cause uh, softening of bones. It brings about increased loss of phosphate. I remember they are concerned with the calcium content of the body. And uh, calcium carbonate and calcium phosphate are responsible for, uh, for uh, the bones. They are the minerals that add in uh, cartilage into bones. Uh, so it causes over secretion of it causes softening of bones and it brings about increased loss of phosphate. Under secretion of it will lead to what we call titany. T E T A N Y. Titany is known as uh, muscle spasm. If most people, uh, they love, uh, most times they could call it, uh, okay, it leads to muscle, muscle spasm. And it could also lead uh, to death. Uh, so these are the under secretions and the over secretions. And so now we're going to be traveling into the world of plant hormones, uh, where we're going to be looking at uh, so many things, so many things on the plants. Oh, oh. Okay, and so we've looked at the under secretion and over secretion of some vital hormones in the body. Uh, we looked at the pituitary gland, which is the master gland. Uh, we looked at the over secretion and the uh, under secretion of it. Uh, we looked at dwarfism. Uh, we looked at gigantism, over secretion, gigantism. Over secretion is da uh, dwarfism. Okay, so having established uh, the different, uh, the vital information that you ought to know under this, we're not going to be looking at uh, the plant uh, hormones. Okay, so now we're going to be looking at plant hormones. I'm going to look at animal hormones. Plant hormones are also called phytohormones. Plant hormones are also called phyto. The word phyto means uh, it is of plant origin. Uh, so there are basically five types of plant hormones. There are basically five types of plant hormones. Uh, we have the oxygen, uh, we have the gibberellin, we have the abscisic acid, uh, we have the ethylene, and lastly, uh, we have what we call cytokine. Cytokine. Oxygen is very, very popular. It is well known among many. We have the gibberellin as well. We have the cytokine. We have the ethene. And we've got uh, the abscisic acid. Abscisic acid is, is known as ABA. A-B-A. -A. It's called abscisic acid. And so now what are oxygens? What are oxygens? What are oxygens? What are oxygens? Oxygens are plant hormones. Oxygens are plant hormones. The most naturally, uh, the naturally occurring oxygen is called IAA. IAA is a naturally is a natural occurring oxygen. Uh, the natural occurring oxygen is called IAA. IAA is indole acetic acid. IAA is indole acetic acid. IA is indole acetic acid. Why the synthetic ones, those ones that could be manufactured, that, that could be synthesized, that could be brought about due to actions of people. It's called the synthetic oxygen. And a very good example is the NAA. NAA is naphthalene acetic acid. And as well we have 2,4-D. 2,4-D is 2,4-dichlorophenol acetic Acid. I take it again. Naturally occurring oxygen is IA, indole acetic acid. Uh, Why the synthetic one is NAA and uh, naphthalene acetic acid. And we have 2,4-D, 2,4-dichlorophenoxy acetic acid. Now, oxygen move across short distances uh, by diffusion. Oxygen move across short distances by diffusion. And uh, why they move by long distances through the phloem? 
Again, or is it moved by short distances by a uh, move uh, cover short distances by diffusion and you cover long distances by, uh, by the use of the fluid? Now, what then is a function of exin? Or is it help in the retention of fruit? Once a fruit is produced, or is it help in, re in retaining that fruit? If it makes sure the fruit is not aborted in the retention of fruit, or is it help in apical dominance? Apical dominance simply means ah. Uh, the, uh, there is a growth from the apices. The plant tends to grow to the apices. It tends to grow towards the apices, the leaf apex. And one thing again is that auxin uh, inhibits lateral growth. It inhibits side growth. Uh, all the growth of the plant is just up. It's not, there's no sideways growth. It inhibits lateral growth. It is against lateral growth. Does it help in inducing flowering? It helps in initiating that. It helps in inducing flowering. It helps in starting flowering. And lastly, Okay, I think I've spoken of that. It helps in the retention of fruit. I was going to say up in the in the, uh, in the induction of patenocarpy. Uh, what is patenocarpy? Patenocarpy is the, for the formation of seedless fruit. And when you produce fruit that lacks seed, patenocarpy is what it is. I was saying as we use today in the production of uh, herbicides to fight weeds, uh, uh, they have been used uh, to do several things, uh, so to speak. Uh, now we're going to be looking at giberelin. Giberelin is produced in the young foliage leaves of roots and embryo it is produced in the young foliage roots in the young foliage leaves and in young embryo as well a gibberellin controls growth in plant it is called a growth hormone it controls growth in plant it breaks dormancy dormancy is a period of rest and uh, after that period it seems as if all physiological it seems as if the seed is dead but the seed is not dead the seed is still viable all physiological activities are, are still happening but they are minimal so the seed is still viable so dormancy is a period of rest where it appears as if the seed is dead but the seed is not there it appears as if no growth uh, nothing is happening uh, but physiological activities are still growing on the seed is still viable now if we, uh, if you're being asked this question and uh, there's this dwarf plant uh on my farmland, all of a sudden I apply the particular chemical, I apply the particular hormone rather, and the dwarf plant grows into a large plant. What kind of hormone did I make use of? The answer is what? <coughs> Giberelin. Now, Giberelin will stimulate dwarf plant to grow into large plant. Giberelin will stimulate dwarf plant to grow into large plant. We're going to be looking at cytokine now. Cytokine, cytokine, cytokine. Cytokine is a growth promoting hormone. It is a growth promoting hormone. It helps. So one of the major, uh, it is found in the root, it is found in the fruit, it is found in the embryo of actively dividing, uh, of, uh, it is found in the root, it is found uh, in the fruit and embryo uh, that are actively undergoing growth. Uh, those embryos that are at the peak, they are actively undergoing growth. Uh, so it is found there. It controls cell division. Basically, it controls mitosis, it controls myosis, cell division. And now when the plant is aging and you apply uh, cytokine, it slows down the age of plant. Uh, it just want the plant to look fresh, forever young, uh, something like that. And so that's the function of uh, the cytokine. It makes the plant, it keeps the plant uh, in check. It makes the plant uh, to retain uh, its, uh, its, young, its youthfulness. As the case may be, uh, it slows down aging and it breaks dormancy. Uh, so the next one is abscisic acid. ABA. Now abscisic acid, uh, how do I call it? It's, an, it's a growth inhibitor. It does not promote growth. Rather, it inhibits growth. It, is, uh, an, uh, it works uh, antagonistically uh, compared to oxygen and cytokine. The functions that are carried out by oxygen and cytokine and gibberellin, abscisic acid works uh, in an opposite direction to them. Now if these ones are breaking dormancy, abscisic acid will induce no mercy. So abscisic acid uh, is a growth inhibitor. It brings about aging. Cytokine uh, reduces aging. Abscisic acid brings about aging. Abscisic acid induces uh, dormancy. And one important thing that you need to know is that it regulates the opening and the closing of the stomata. The stomata opens during the day and closes at night. Abscisic acid is the hormone that is uh, responsible for that. And now, the only gaseous hormone uh, present in plants is called etin. Etin is also known as what? Ethylene. The only gaseous hormone present in plants is called etin. It is also known as what? It's also known as ethylene. Etin, etin, C2. H4, C2H4, and let me quickly uh, show you uh, the structure. This is the structure of ethene, or you can call it ethylene. It is the only gaseous 
hormone. It is the only gaseous hormone. One of the major functions of a thing is to esteem fruit ripening. It esteem fruit ripening. It esteem fruit ripening. It produces a respiratory climateric as well. And when you see your fruit ripening and all that, naturally, maybe uh, you tie them in a sack and all that, and they get ripened. And the function of the ethene or the ethylene, the esteem fruit ripening, and they are producing leaf and stems and in young root. Uh -huh. uh, so we've, like, we've looked at the five major ones. However, there's this special flowering hormone. It's a special flowering hormone. It is called florigene. A special flowering hormone is called florigene. And the major function of the florigene is to initiate flowering a plant. And now let's quickly go through this again. Uh, let's go through uh, this again. Oxygen. Oxygen, naturally occurring oxygen is IAA. Uh, synthetic, those ones that are artificial, those ones that can be manufactured, I will have NAA, naphthalene, acetic acid, I will have 2,4, dichlorophenoxy, acetic acid. One major thing you need to know about oxygen is that oxygen uh, promotes growth in the apices towards the leaf apex. Any growth uh, side by side, they are not in support of it, so they inhibit lateral growth. One major function of oxygen again, is, that, is that it helps in parthenocarpy, the formation of fruits without seed. The formation of fruits without seed and they induce flowering. Uh, Giberelin is also a growth hormone. It breaks down uh, dormancy and it controls growth in plant. One thing again, for a dwarf plant to grow into a large plant, Giberelin is the one at work. Cyclokinin is found in uh, uh, in young seed, it's found in young fruit, it's found in young roots, those ones that are actively undergoing growth. Uh, they control cell division, mitosis and meiosis. They also have been breaking down dormancy. Acetic acid uh, carry out uh, functions that are opposite to oxygen, opposite to gibberellin, and opposite to cytokinin. If cytokinin, oxygen and gibberellin are going this way, acetic acid is going the other way. It is antagonistic. Its functions are oppositely compared uh, to other ones. So since these ones are breaking dormancy, this one is inducing dormancy. Are you with me? Since this ones are, since this particular one, the cytokine is uh, trying to reduce the age of plant, making the plant look young. This one is supporting the age of plant, making them look uh, very old. And one major function of acetic acid again is that it regulates the opening and the closing of stomata. The stomata opening during the day and closing at night is a function of the acetic acid. Ethene is the only gaseous plant hormone that we have. The only gaseous plant hormone. The general formula is C2H. It is also called ethylene. It is produced in leaf, a stem, and young root. It extends fruit ripening. And lastly, we have a special flower in the world called florigen. Its major function is to initiate flowering in plants. Wow, it's been an awesome time out with you. As some questions will pop on your screen, uh, make sure you attend them. Do the ritual. Uh, thank you.